It's day five, the majority of the week complete, the first week of POF, and here I still am trundling my way through uh, getting towards the end of the story. A couple of people at this point have said, wow, WP, you are playing slow. I didn't quite believe them until today when I'm realizing, yeah, damn, the most of the first week and I haven't finished the story, I would have thought even with a really lengthy, uh, decent plot, I'd be done in a day or two. At the end of the day, I am a no-life nerd that does nothing but play this MMO. Mo, and here I am. But nonetheless, I still have had a great many adventures, fun things I want to talk to you guys about. The magic of the expansion still has not worn off for me, and uh, I've got a lot of fun things to share with you in a similar vein to the previous two days, in that a lot of it is tied to Guild Wars 1 stuff that uh, I think many of you will find uh, really, really interesting. Uh, on the community side, there have been other things going on. Currently, as I record this, there is a huge thread about Guild Wars 2 on our gaming that's had tens of thousands of upvotes, and I'm really happy to have seen. Normally, I don't talk about this kind of stuff, but as you guys know, I'm doing a competition right now to try and grow the Guild Wars 2 scene to hopefully make people take a look back at this product that they probably dismissed way back in 2012. And and the devs spent their time on this expansion making something purely for veterans of the franchise without expanding things, without looking too much to acquiring new blood. And it's actually paying off for them in giving them new blood because so many people have enjoyed their experience and they're sharing it and people are enthusiastically upvoting and so forth. That's so cool to see. Specifically, this thread is about the Raptor animations or whatever. Uh, but it's it's really interesting seeing all these people who legitimately haven't played for years and years and years and asking what updates have come in. I wouldn't even know where to begin describing how different Guild Wars 2 is of today to Guild Wars 2 of those early days. I mean, where would you start? The fact that there's a wardrobe system now? The fact there's actual end game? I mean, you may as well just assume it's a totally new product at this point, and it's a little scary to see, honestly, but exciting, and I suppose that's the important part. So, not too many hours, sadly, on day five. Uh, I got maybe four to six in total. That was to do with real life stuff, but some big milestones were achieved. First, I fully finished Weaver. I mentioned yesterday I was right near the end. I got the Elite. I haven't really played with it too much. Uh, as excited and wonderful and brilliant as all the expansion has been, I genuinely do want to play another Elite Specialization right now. And I am very much looking forward to my second playthrough when I think I'm going to play it as a Seraph Scourge build. I want a build that can do good, consistent, comfortable damage, but also has that supporty stuff where I can give other people might and I can uh, play with some new tools. And I think that a Seraph based Scourge is really right up my alley. It kind of fulfills all of those. I also generally want to play a power Reaper. Uh, I know that Reaper is two Heart of Thorns and it's two years ago, but I think that seems really fun and sustaining and interesting for open world uh, respect as well. I'll probably try and play some Fashion Wars to make it look like the Prince of Persia, Dahaka, who's one of my favorite video game villains of all time. We'll see how close I can actually get towards that. That would be quite fitting for the continent as it stands too. Uh, I've done some other stuff finally outside of the expansion in that playtime too. I've actually done some raiding, not much. It was a Wing 4 run that didn't go too well. People were playing with new Elite Specs and uh, things are all over the place. What I can say right now, if people are out of the loop, is that Firebrand is doing some insane damage. Now, there was that issue where stat conversions were broken and Firebrand was doing really ridiculous damage. Even after the fix to that, Firebrand is still kind of leagues ahead right now, and I'm very much expecting a nerf. But if you want easy challenge mode raid kills, if you want a good opportunity to get into raids, they're very easy right now just because of all the wild balance. And I know there are going to be Firebrands in the comments who are saying, no, we won't get nerfed. Believe me, guys, I think you might be. It is an interesting build in that it does a lot of damage and it has barely any CC and almost no capacity to self heal itself, which I find quite fun. It's like a very raw damagey thing. It's the kind of build I would expect to have occurred on like the Thief and some other classes a long time ago. And here it is on the Guardian now. But yeah, it's it's crazy overperforming. And I didn't have too much experience in raids, but that's what I did. Uh, so let's talk about what I was playing. I did a little bit more Vabby exploration. When I say a little, I really mean a little. I'm talking maybe half an hour before chickening out and going back to the Desolation. The objective was still to map complete the Desolation, and I still haven't finished it. Three days I've been on this map, and three days I haven't done it. Now, there were less playtime uh, here, but still, I think all I need are the top left and top right sections along the bone wall. Uh, everywhere else I generally spent a lot of time and it's because there's one specific heart region in the Desolation I hadn't been to yesterday, I have now, that took a massive amount of my time. It's incredibly fun. It is the Lair 
of the Forgotten. That's what I'm going to be talking about a lot today. Uh, people did confirm to me in the comments yesterday as well that there is basically no more story in the Desolation beyond what I've experienced. I was hoping a little that maybe you go through the Desolation very quickly and then it like yo-yos you back a little bit. And I think that when Story does that, it's actually quite nice. There's a moment where you can return to the Amnoon Oasis, for example, after visiting the second map, and I really like that part of the story. I was hoping maybe the Desolation had something like that, and it doesn't, according to you guys in the comments, which I'm a bit disappointed by. Maybe, though, uh, this is a very lore-rich area, and it's a very interesting area. Maybe we'll get more with Living World Season 4. Remember, guys, that our original trip to Rata Novus in Heart of Thorns was a matter of moments, and Tangled Depths, just like the Desolation might have here, really suffered for not having having very good meaningful story in it, or a high quantity of, and that Living World Season 3 then went back and fixed, so maybe Living World Season 4 can host its story, not just in new places, but also it can return there, just as we saw Season 3 did, while adding new maps, and uh, and so, fingers crossed on that. The plan, though, is now to finish the story. Right after I record this video, I'm off to finish Path of Fire, and I can finally stop being scared of spoilers. Which, by the way, the community's been amazing about. You'd think me, at the center of all this, you know, uh, activity and being so public-facing, I would have had stuff spoiled for me. Uh, obviously, I've been cagey, but I haven't rushed, and I haven't been spoiled, and I think that's pretty goddamn awesome. I'm probably asking for, for trouble by announcing that to the internet right here, but there you have it. Alright, finally, I know you're all keen on it. Highlights from the Desolation. First, let's talk about the Jackal. Now, I did acquire it yesterday. I didn't get much opportunity to play it. I have now ranked uh, via Masteries uh, all the way up to getting access to the Sand Portals. So this was actually a bit of a challenge. Because I haven't gone to Vabby yet, I really did have to exhaust a lot of the achievements. You know, I had to spend a long time going back to, say, the Ellen Riverlands and finding all of the bits of Unbound Magic to get that mastery, or collecting all of the Sunspit armor to get that mastery, though the Sunspit who was, who'd lost their armor unfortunately bugged for me and I couldn't quite finish it, or killing Harpies to try and get a rare drop from them so that I could get another mastery point. And just like with Heart of Thorns, it was not the experience that meant anything, it was the mastery points that meant it all. And because I've not properly explored Vabby, I was, uh, you know, really stressed to get the most out of the maps in order to finally get this. Uh, but I have the Jackal, and I have the ability to go through those portals. My god, going through those portals! If you've been playing the expansion like me, and seeing those and thinking, I wonder where that leads, and thinking, you know, it, it could be somewhere exciting, or it might just be a small skip. Believe me, a lot of the- a lot more of them go to exciting places than you might realize. Check out this footage here, okay? This is the, uh, Desert Highlands. This is a sand portal you can go through that leads to another portal that takes you up into the sky. Coincidentally, it was the middle of the night when I did this, revealing a floating ghostly city miles in the air. What is this? I already said that the Desert Highlands was like my favorite map in terms of the environment design and what it's been like to explore owing to the Tomb of the Primeval Kings and so forth. But what is this? This is ludicrous. You get to go through. I got a hidden achievement as well because I went there at night and stood at a certain place on the Jackal and admired the views. Wow, I, uh, I'm blown away, and I've still got a lot of these portals to go through, but man, that is a, a nice thing. This is like everything I wanted from Newhawk Wallows, which Heart of Thorns basically did, and then some. This is good. I am, um, it takes a lot for me to actually enjoy something about the mastery system under its current implementation, but when it delivers, it really does deliver. I don't know how much we can say it was the mastery system that delivered this as, as much as it was just, you know, how they handled the exploration, but still. And I've got all those other temples and fun places to go to. Uh, what a, what a great experience. As for the jackal itself, I've tried my best to understand the story, but I'm only picking up p bits and pieces right now. So as far as I understand, uh, the jackal, as they tell you in the open world, Jackals are made from twisted, tormented, corrupted, corrupted sands that are left over from Abaddon's last attempt to enact Nightfall back in the last game. And what we're essentially playing as are Marganites, or the essence of Marganites, that have been twisted and forced to bend to the Jinn's will via these runes. I think that's the story. I mean, they've got all these really interesting elements in there. I wish I could draw a more uh, complete picture of what's going on. Maybe you guys in the comments could tell me about it, but I love what I'm seeing. And obviously, um, talk about the Marganites is, is something I would really want from the Desolation. It's actually quite light on the ground. Now, I guess, technically speaking, if you look at the lore as an overview, Marganites 
knights weren't hanging around the Desolation for that long. I mean, they were there everywhere in Guild Wars 1 because we were at the height of Nightfall when we travelled there. But, you know, big picture, 250 years later, how much uh, influence would they have left on the land? Maybe not so much, uh, but at least we get it here and we get a bit more from the Jinn. What great lore attached to this mount. The environment you pick it up, I've already gushed over yesterday. I've actually made my mount spotlight videos too where I'll gush about it more there. So I will spare you guys more of that. As for traveling around and using the teleportation, it's fun, but it's very much struck me how the raptor can do everything the jackal can do, or the springer can go higher than the jackal, or the skimmer. Because the desolation is very much designed to use the skimmer a lot, it means that the jackal really feels like an optional man. You know, you might describe the griffin, the final one, as an optional one. I mean, that's a secret one, so obviously it's optional. The jackal kind of feels in that place as well. It feels very optional to me. That's not necessarily uh, the worst thing in the world, but it's more so than I was expecting. So let's talk about some other uh, highlights from the Desolation. Uh, a couple of really great events. Uh, first, uh, the Janundu. So Janundu are in the Desolation. And these brought a smile to my face. Those who play Guild Wars 2 very closely will remember several months ago, uh, before even the big leaks, I believe this was, the first thing that tipped us off to the fact this expansion would be set in this region of the world was the devs, when making the, these Janundu models, they accidentally put them in the live game. And you could play like Twilight Arbor like six months ago, and there were Janundu there for a very brief time before they quickly hot fixed it out. But it kind of revealed, oh god, we could be going back to the desolation and so forth. Uh, back then, we didn't know if the Janundu themselves would be a mount or whatever. I've talked about that before. In the Janundu in Guild Wars 1 kind of became all of the combat and they didn't want mounts in Guild Wars 2 to become all of the combat. So they're not. Uh, they also don't really take a very big prominent role uh, in the center stage for the story, which I also find kind of interesting. And they're just kind of milling about. So my first experience of seeing them was quite underwhelming. They're not as big as they used to be. And in fact, a lot of the giant creatures and demons that lived in the Crystal Desert aren't around anymore. What about the cracked stones and some of these other big things? Hopefully Living World Season 4 will bring those back. The Janandu feel a lot smaller now. Uh, and the other thing that kind of disappointed me was when they attack, they weren't majorly sieging. They're just like doing these little spits. Now, it's since occurred to me that actually, if you look at Janandu in Guild Wars 1, their auto attack was a little spit thing, like an acid spit. The siege was a special ability only some of them could do, and you had to unlock the capacity to be able to execute. Uh, via the Guild Wars 1 main storyline. So maybe it makes sense that they all just spit a little bit, but they're a little bit less intimidating. So I was a bit disappointed by Janundu, but then I found this event. So there's an event where you tame some Janundu, and you use them to, to siege and attack two strongholds at once, an awakened stronghold and a forged stronghold. What a great event. It really rounded out my opinion of it and assuaged a lot of my fears and, and, and worries that the Janundu had been mishandled in the expansion because that event is so badass. So that was a really fun moment for me immediately. Uh, allows you to get a couple of points of interest and thing, I think, too, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to because you have to break into these fortifications, destroy lots of bone trebs and cannons and so forth. Uh, that was one event. It gets better though. Another really good event I experienced was there's a gin in a part of the Desolation, an air gin, and it's a group event. We two manned it where you DPS this air, this air gin down and they're really threatening. But when they hit like 75% health, they just flee really fast. They just zoom away and you have to catch up with them in a very brief window of opportunity. You have to get back to where they've moved to. Uh, and then you have to break their break bar. So if you guys remember Crucible of Eternity, that event that locked that dungeon off in 2012, imagine just like a really new, really good version of that. So you've got to travel really far away, but you're obviously in the desolation, so you've got to use a combination of different mounts to find the new location, to get back to the character, to then execute your crowd control abilities and break the break bar. It's like a really beautiful blend of all the engine enhancements and gameplay capabilities that have now been introduced, not just in Path of Fire, but Heart of Thorns too, because break bars are a big part of this. And then you get to fight him, and then he runs again, and you get to fight him and run again. Really rewarding. Uh, some random player came and tagged the event at the last second and got credit, which I felt a little bit angry about I shouldn't have but it was like you didn't work for this event but I got a cool reward from this as well that unlocked a collection that seems something to do with lots of gin high level gin I got to kill a lot of them and get these powerful jewels the collection uh, dialogue the user interface actually talks about Zomoros and some secret chamber of Zomoros which I'm scared is sort of a semi spoiler for later in the story I don't know I would expect that maybe to have something to do with Vabi uh, but that was a great experience and all the items still the items remain interesting to pick up if you guys are lacking flavor or feeling like there's not enough lore just just take care when you're looking at your inventory. Mouse over the junk stuff you get and um, and read all the little flavor text they've got on there because there is so, so, so much. Uh, probably, though, the best event I experienced in the Desolation 
uh, is another one in this area of the world. Uh, where you discover a secret room that Joko has uh, some people. <laughs> How can I best describe this? So you follow a ghost who unlocks the entrance to the, the, this room. You destroy a ton of awakened that are guarding it. You descend into this tomb. Even just the act of descending into this dark tomb feels good and feels like what I'd want from a desert uh, experience in any kind of RPG. Uh, but when you break in, you come into this beautiful environment that feels very remote from the rest of the map. And inside are a bunch of living, regular people. And what you realize is very grim. What you realize is that Joko has blackmailed and coerced and manipulated these free, living, real women to basically join a harem of his and become like his many wives to service him as he pleases and provide him entertainment and whatever you wish. And they kind of just mill about in this room here. Oh God, what is this place? One question at a time. This is Joko's betrothal chamber. All of us here, through one path or another, are sworn to wed the great king. Eric, I'll get you all out of here. Quickly, come with me. You'll help us? We are not captives. We I've are gifts the to the king. From our families or our leaders. Some volunteered. In exchange, Joko allows those we care for to survive and prosper. To leave would be a breach of contract. And you get to talk to them and you can convince them to try and leave. And they say, well, look, we would leave. But by, by sort of selling myself in this way to Joko, I've ensured the safety of my family. Like, it's dark, it's grim, it's pretty adult what we're dealing with here. This is the exact kind of tone I want from Guild Wars 2. And this is not the only place that Path of Fire has done it. It's one of the least spoilery places that I can talk about that it's done it. And you get to wander around and interact with these people and it's so weird. It put a smile on my face in the weirdest way to see that the devs were tackling this subject material. And they make it funny too. Like there's a harpy. The flock will remain strong through Jocko's will. A harpy in his harem. There's an ogre. Kralkatorik branded my village. Without the strength to survive, I turned to Joko. And even best of all, there is a Choya. There's legitimately a Choya. And when you walk over to try and talk to her, this happens. Leave her be. She's shy and rarely speaks. <laughs> An NPC warns you that she's going to be quiet. You'll see sometimes like a, a servant will go to uh, interact with them. In the upper levels of this area, you can see that they've been painting uh, paintings of uh, Joko just over and over again and doing these little sculptures of him. What a weird and beautiful and interesting place. Oh my goodness. I wish that Guild Wars 2 had been doing stuff like this for a long time ago. And uh, definitely a well worth event going for, guys, if you haven't done that just yet. It gets better though. Um, this is still not the best though. In terms of the event, that's probably the, the, the best event and an interesting place to go. But of course, this is the Desolation. The Desolation has a lot of great lore. It's got the Realm of Torment at the center. Uh, there is a meta event to do with this that I haven't seen complete. I don't actually think it's that hard, but it's a bit like Auric Basin where you need three different groups to attack it. But it's not like you need the entire map to do so. And I think the only reason I haven't seen it be complete is because I play maybe at off-peak hours uh, or people just aren't interested in the moment. I saw one commander attempt once, but one of the lanes, if you will, failed. Uh, and we never quite quite got to see. But you can go there anyway to the uh, Realm of Torment. Just there'll be tons of enemies if the meta hasn't been finished. They don't lock this area of the map off to you like Dragon Stand would do. Which many of you guys have said that's what you didn't like about metas. Uh, but you can get like a hero challenge there. There's a really difficult mastery point where you have to climb quite high on the spring. And I spent a long time messing about. It was very odd seeing the entrance to the Realm of Torment right beneath me. And it's been like grated over. Uh, and maybe I wonder if more stuff will happen in the story for that in the future. But you've got big areas like this in the map. One of the things I would be most excited, and I've always been most excited to revisit in Guild Wars 2, is the Lair of the Forgotten. So, episode 6, we were reintroduced to Livia, and Livia mentioned very briefly the Scepter of Ore. The Scepter of Ore and its twin uh, artifact, the Staff of the Mists, are two of the most interesting, like, relics, items, 
in this entire franchise to me. Like, we've got others. We've got, like, powerful weapons and things like Khaled Bog, and, and there have been a few floating around. But to me, it's always been about the Scepter of All mostly and then the Staff of the Mist a little too. So in Guild Wars 1, we get to go to the Desolation. There's an outpost there called the Lair of the Forgotten where we can meet some Forgotten. One of them talks about this crazy important artifact the staff of the mists it is a uh, it's a twin relic to the scepter of ore and the marganites in guild wars one were trying to get it abaddon was trying to claim this artifact and it would allow him to manipulate the physical dimensions of, of, of the world uh and we had to destroy it so you go on this quest with this uh, forgotten to destroy the staff of the mists you throw it in an abyssal pit where apparently can be never never be recovered and from here, it will be broken. Uh, it was one of my favorite things to show off to people uh, in my Guild Wars 1 Let's Play series. And I've always wanted to see what the fate of that area was, what was going on there. So you can return in Guild Wars 2 to this location. I have not been able to find the exact point that we destroyed the Staff of the Mists. And I have not been able to find anywhere any reference to the Staff of the Mists at all. Maybe there is one in the map, and I just haven't seen it yet. But I was looking for so long to find it, and unless it's in a very obscure place, I don't think the devs have acknowledged it. Which is rare for Path of Fire, because Path of Fire has acknowledged basically everything I would want them to have, except this. And so I'm not actually disappointed that they haven't referenced it right now. Because I kind of, I just think it's more of a curious thing that they haven't referenced it. We'll see. But so we know that the Forgotten have been defeated and, and they're gone. And we mostly just find branded ones. There are no Forgotten at the Lair of the Forgotten. But we can see some interesting things left over. There's a fun thing here where there's, uh, I think it's eight statues left over from the Forgotten we got to speak to back then. And we get to interact with each of them. And once you interact with all of them, you can go to a big statue and supposedly get more lore. Uh, it was fun finding all the statues, but the lore at the end didn't really deliver anything. So I wonder what's going on there. I didn't even get an achievement or anything for having messed about with that. So I don't know whether I'm missing something. Uh, but many characters and things from the first game here are referenced. So there were ghosts here too. Ghosts from the Academy at Rin. And those ghosts are still there. The same ones in Guild Wars 2. So we could talk to them. And they've got that same kind of light a jovial disposition again. I, I, never more have I wanted to play a different race. I want to see what the char say to these ghosts because you, uh, the ghosts can talk about Rin, and I would love to play as a char and be like, "Yeah, we built the Black Citadel. On top of that, it's a it's a ruin." Ah, uh, because I don't think they quite believe uh, me as a human when I talk to them about it. I don't remember the exact dialogue, but there's all these beautiful references. Now, one of the coolest things is the presence of a new ghost, a ghost of a prominent character from the Nightfall campaign, and that is Dunkoro. So Dunkoro is here in the open worlds. Uh, if people don't know, Dunkoro was uh, much like Livia in that he was a hero that would adventure with you through that respective campaign. So Livia was an Eye of the North hero. Dunkoro was a Nightfall hero. And he was one of the earliest heroes you got. He was a monk that would support your party. He was a tactician. He's one of my favorite characters from the story. And during Nightfall, at the end, you realize he had a son who died. And Dunkoro's ghost is here in GW2 at the Lair of the Forgotten. He feels responsible for the suffering that the Yelonans have gone through because he was there when we, the hero in Guild Wars 1, helped Joko rise to power again. And because he feels responsible, he, uh, he is trying to do his bit and you get to talk to him about all kinds of things. I love that they included him. You even get voice acting from him. Uh, it is funny that they did this because Don Coro, if you think about it, is a character who did what we're attempting to do in Path of Fire. Path of Fire, we are attempting to take down a god. And Don Coro was one of the party that took down a god in Guild Wars 1, uh, Abaddon. And so it was kind of crazy that they put Dunkoro in here and not have him a p be a part of the main story. Like, I almost feel like the fact he's here is so profound. Going to his ghost and getting advice from his ghost could have been a big story beat and could have been a fun thing to do. Now, the devs didn't do that, whether they didn't have enough time or they didn't think of it or they didn't think it was important enough, I don't know. Um, but I have a lot of respect for them for putting him in anyway. And you could even ask him about having four Abaddon and you could say, hey, yeah, we're fighting a god too. Can you help us out? I wonder whether there was a temptation from the developers at this point to have Dunkoro turn around and say, Oh yeah, I fought a god, but that's nothing like what you're doing. You're trying to hunt down Balthazar. I was trying to stop a god coming back from the mists. You are dealing with something way worse. A god has come back from the mists and is rampaging around the world. You're fighting like the equivalent of if Nightfall came to pass. The devs could have written that in on Dunkoro, um, but I respect that they didn't do that. 
They didn't do that, and I wonder whether they didn't because they didn't want to invalidate the importance of the Nightfall story. They didn't want to draw a direct comparison between GW2 and GW1 and kind of suggest that Guild Wars 2 was bigger and better in all ways. And I don't know whether that is what was going on behind the lines, but that's what I thought as I read it. Everything that they did with Dunkora I really loved and, uh, and was a lot of fun. Would you believe me, though, if even after all of this, I still haven't told you the coolest thing to me about the Lair of the Forgotten? And it's this, okay? It relates to some ghosts that are behind Dunkoro. Now, I've talked many, 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 many times about the tone of Guild Wars 1. And especially when it gets most grim in the first game are these interactable objects you can find in the Crystal Desert. In that when you click these bleached bones, you got these stories. These stories of the men and women who died there and the suffering they went through before they met their end. And they are dark. Probably the darkest of them all depicts infanticide, whereby a father, I believe it's a father, has just lost his mother, uh, his wife, sorry, to starvation or, or to predators or something. And now he's alone with his two children and he chooses to poison his own children so that he doesn't have to watch them suffer anymore before offing himself as well. Like, it's that dark. This is the kind of stuff that we were dealing with, with in the first game. And I've always lamented the loss of real kind of grim stories like that. Not that the entire game needs to deal with them, but I've lamented the loss of those because Guild Wars 2's tone very consistently has never hit those kind of levels. Path of Fire, as I mentioned earlier, kind of does. And what I was really happy to see is here at the Lair of the Forgotten, that story, that exact story, that, that's just one bleached bone of many, right? The ghosts from that story, the children, the ghosts of the children from that story are here at the Lair of the Forgotten. And they talk about their experience and they allude to it. And Guild Wars 2 now has dealt with that same subject material. And for all the complaints I've had in the past, oh, Guild Wars 2 doesn't, you know, go uh, dark enough, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, I can't think of any better way for people like me to have an opinion like that to have been addressed and for them to say, no, look, we will continue dealing with stories like this. And they have here. And they have many times in Path of Fire. Guild Wars 2 is definitely in a place, and especially since, like, the Bastion of the Penitent came out, it's in a place where it can be very lighthearted and very adolescent and very comical and very um, kind of childish is the term a lot of people use in many places. But it's such a broad product now that if you look somewhere else, you can find these darker things and you can find these more important things and you can find these more grim things. And I, I very much love that Path of Fire did that. And uh, that is one of my favorite things from Guild Wars 1 as a representation of what Guild Wars 1 could be like. And now here it is in Guild Wars 2. Uh, I thought that that was absolutely fucking fantastic. And I'm super, super happy. There's other fun stuff that I found, uh, but this VOD's got on pretty uh, long. I think that's most of it in the Desolation. I did meet a Soul Beast here at the Lair of the Forgotten as well. Maybe there's another Elite Specialization NPC, but I'm not sure. The Soul Beast was talking about wanting to be the first to hunt down the Hydra. I thought that was a nice touch. And, uh, and yeah, the last thing I could have talked about yesterday, but I will do here. Uh, I noticed something also. There was a reference in the Desolation to an aspect of lore. I think it was like a Janundu hatchery. Or maybe it was something about giant bones or something. I, I can't remember exactly. But there's a reference in Guild Wars 2, in the Desolation, to some lore that only was previously data mined from Guild Wars 1. So this happened a lot in Nightfall. And a little bit beyond as well. People started data mining the first game and they realized there was like interesting lore describing places that we've never really known was canon. And it had never been officially drawn as canon because it was never officially front-facing in the game given to us. It was only data mined. And the devs never gave us any um, exact uh, definition on whether it was or wasn't canon. And in Guild Wars 2, what's happened now is they're referencing that information. So what was previously only data mined has now just become canon in Guild Wars 2. And for the examples I've talked about here, they're, th this, these are fairly minor inconsequential things, but it does have some broader um, implications then, because the idea of a god predating Abaddon, a dead spider god, a titanic spider known as Arachnia, this is some really fun lore. Arachnia, the previous spider god, but it was only ever data mined from GW1, and now Guild Wars 2 
has canonized some of that stuff. So does that mean that Arachnia could now be canon? What do you guys think? If it does mean that, I think that's uh, pretty damn cool, especially considering, guess what, my necromancer, who I'll be very soon playing in the desert, is called Arachnia. That's right, I snagged that username a long time ago, and uh, it's one of my favorite other aspects of lore, which has been kind of paid off on here. So another great day, another really awesome experience. Sadly, I've still been mostly stuck in the desolation. Bit of raiding, uh, still all those races and bounties and things I haven't done just yet. But uh, I'm super keen to be done now with getting on with the final story and moving on to Vabby and joining the ranks of the rest of you who can openly click spoiler threads and discussions on the official forums and Reddit and so on. So uh, let me know what you guys think. Hopefully I taught you something fun today. Hopefully you've still been having some cool adventures out there of your own. Have you started playing a second character? I'd love to hear. And uh, until tomorrow, take it easy, everyone. I'll see you very shortly.